Claudia Lewis is a partner in the law firm of Venable LLP, and our topic today is what the FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, is up to during the pandemic. Claudia, welcome. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. So what is the FDA doing? What's going on? How is it revising its usual practices and regulatory authority during the pandemic? Well, as you know, the pandemic has affected all of us, the entire community, and the FDA is working very hard to meet demands for PPE and other vaccines or drugs and other things to make sure we have the supply demands. So it's been working overtime in terms of making sure that masks that normally need a 510K clearance or hand sanitizers that are usually subject to OTC drugs, that there's been what we would consider to be some relaxation in the rules and regulations governing those products that are usually highly, highly regulated. So the agency has issued a number of guidances very quickly. Um, One thing that I would say, Robert, just in terms of a point of reference, is the agency usually takes 18 months to revise its rules and regulations. And the agency in the course of this pandemic has issued about 40 new guidances in the course in a matter of weeks. 40? Oh, my goodness. Yes, 40. (laughs) <laughs> and they're all designed to make sure that we have the healthcare supplies that we need, but that they're still safe and that they're still effective. So some of the regulations that have been suspended are registration requirements, listing requirements. Um, they've also allowed us to uh, partner with other jurisdictions. So if you've gotten clearance in Japan, for example, the FDA still wants to review what you have for your particular device, but um, it's with the presumption that the device is likely safe and effective. Mm-hmm. So a little less red tape, that's good news. Yes, right? absolutely. But the tricky part is how can, how can companies keep up with all these new guidance documents, more than 40 of them? It just, I mean, it just seems like a huge task just to figure out what they're all saying. I think that that's true. And Robert, you touched on a very good point. So the agency publishes them every day and they have updates on their website and they push out communications, letting people who are part of the industry know that the guidances have been updated, but it's still a lot of information. It's almost like drinking from a fire hose, if you would imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we have been working overtime at Venable and I imagine many firms across the nation as well in trying to digest the information quickly, update it and relate it to our clients in a way that's meaningful that will you know, make sure that the, the object, FDA's objectives are met, but that our clients are still um, getting the um, materials that we need, masks, gowns, uh, uh, shields, all those types of things as quickly as possible. Yeah. And so it's been a team effort really between the FDA and the legal community. Mm-hmm. Okay, good news again, because less red tape, less bureaucracy. But at the same time, I wonder to what extent does this open up the door to the possibility of counterfeit, go- counterfeit goods, the idea that there might be some gray market goods sneaking into this? How can companies ensure against that happening? So also another good point and something that we dealt with. So when the agency decided that they were allowed to some relaxation of the rules, of course, counterfeit products are going to be part of that. Um, So one good example is that the FDA had published a list of reliable um, companies abroad, either in China or in Europe or what have you. And initially, um, and so if you were getting your your PPE supplies from these, what the FDA considered to be, um, you know, reliable resources and suppliers, then that was also allowing the FDA to to review either your EUA or your uh, application to get it into the country more quickly. So initially the, the list was 10 pages and after the FDA took a, a, far, a closer look at some of the supplies and, and saw some of the counterfeiting at the um, ports that the list was reduced to two pages quite quickly. Um, one of the things that we've been working with um, with our clients is just making sure that we're looking at we're not just taking the words on face value So we were getting testing data and we were noticing as we were making our submissions to the FDA that some of the testing data was um, not accurate, that it seemed to be coming from two labs, um, that the signature that we were told in the email was not the signatory and on the documents themselves. And so we were doing a lot of due diligence or counseling our clients to do diligence 
um, themselves to make sure they weren't getting counterfeit um, products. So it's, it's, there's, some of the counterfeits are quite uh, sophisticated, um, but if you look closely and do your own due diligence, then you can sort of see that it's not um, what it might, should be, or what is represented to be in each mm -hmm. instance. But the FDA is not taking its eye off the ball on the question of counterfeit goods by kind of backing away on some of these regulations. It sounds like they've still got a pretty close eye on it. Oh, absolutely. The FDA is safety first. So it doesn't matter if we're meeting the supply needs, if the PPE is defective or not, or is not effective. And so there's many safety parameters. It's not enough that it actually provides the protection but you don't want the doctor who might be in surgery or um, intubing someone, the mask to be irritating. So the agency still had good parameters about what type of materials had to be in the mask themselves um, or in the gowns to make sure that it wasn't creating unintended um, safety concerns. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wonder is we hear reports of companies making PPE and other types of pandemic related equipment that they were not used to making. An automaker turns around and starts to make ventilators and companies that never made masks at all suddenly are making N95 masks or supposedly N95 masks. What are the issues there? How does FDA deal with these newbies, these companies that come in and are making this stuff for the first time? Are they incorporated into their approved list? Are there issues there or what's going on? So the FDA has some general guidance on what the ventilators need to look like, what the safety parameters are, and the agency is reviewing what the companies are doing in terms of you would submit a proposal, we're gonna move, and you're very right, the car automakers, everyone stepped in. Um, so let me back up, Robert. First of all, I, I've just been overwhelmed by how many people have been willing to help and reconfigure their businesses from something else to, to address the emergency um, health net, uh, needs of the nation. Um, and I'm also been very um, overwhelmed by how quickly the and nimble the FDA has been. But each and every step of the way has been a safety um, parameter and safety net that the agency has had in place. And so the, there's guidelines, there's a set parameter of um, configurations and specifications that you would need to meet. Um, and you can self-affirm that you've met them, but the agency is reviewing them to make sure that they are in fact there. Um, and with qualified data and, and statements and the like, um, the agency is allowing this shift in manufacturers. And of course you have bad actors, so not everyone is you know, doing it for the, right, for the right reasons. And I've been very surprised by how quickly FDA has been able to weed them out. So even though their primary resources are limited and very focused on making sure we get as much PPE into the country or allow this new supply chain to unfold, um, they do have enforcement practices, and you've seen a rash of warning letters from the FDA. They've joined forces with the FTC. The FDA is also very engaged on the state level in terms of making sure that where they can't put people out, you know, we're all sheltering in place, obviously, um, that state um, agents and agencies are also partnering with the agency to make sure that, you know, the shift is safe mm -hmm. and effective. Yeah. In fact, the FDA is not the only game in town when it comes to a regulatory body that impinges on this type of stuff. We're hearing a lot about shipments of critical supplies such as masks being held up at the border by Customs and Border Protection. I'm wondering to what extent does CBP work work hand in hand with FDA and the, all these you know all these different regulatory bodies informing one another. I mean, what kind of challenges there are? You have to satisfy multiple multiple agencies and regulatory schemes, do you not? Yes, and so, you know, there's always more than one governing agency and CBP is something that our team works with routinely. We have a huge international trade team and they've been helping us along with the FDA guidances, put the right codes in and make sure that the, um, the supply chain flows very naturally and in compliance. Um, and CBP, of course, is looking for testing material, looking to see if the right paperwork is there, and reporting through to FDA when they have questions. And obviously the FDA still has import alerts in place. Um, they still have standards, and there's a, a interface that they do quite seamlessly, thankfully, where CBP is like, this is not a trusted um, supplier. FDA is like, okay, let's evaluate this. And before it's imported, the agency does its own inspections um, to make sure that it is what it purports to be. 
um, and is appropriate, um, label it appropriately, and there's enough data in support of it where, mm -hmm. where necessary. Okay, I guess it's anybody's guess, is it not, as to how long this is going to go on? I mean, this is this is an open-ended thing on FDA's part. This this ch temporary change in its approach and regulations, or has it given any clue as to how long it might be before we get back to quote unquote normal? So, actually, that's a good question. It's a client that our uh, a question that our clients are asking, um, because a lot of people have taken advantage of these temporary rules and guidance documents that um, are not going to be in place forever. And so what you've seen with responsible um, companies is that they're pivoting to what the normal FDA regulatory course um, and evaluation might be, knowing that they want to stay and remain good providers of PPE. Um, and the FDA is still issuing guidance and hasn't sort of intimated when the um, cutoff might be. I would suspect that we would see these guidances stay in place at least probably six months to a year after the vaccine is issued. I think that um, the, the need for masks and other gowns and other types of protective equipment is going to be there until we have a good cure and a vaccine in place. So I don't think that it's going to be anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I think the agency probably won't start reevaluating it until late 2021 or early 2022. Yeah, well, that's some really good insight and some good news to a certain extent that FDA is getting a little less bureaucratic, but at the same time doesn't mean that companies should be taking their eye off the ball. And Claudia Lewis of Venable, thank you so much for helping us to see what, what needs to happen these days, what's going on out there, and, and to give us some really good insights. Thanks very much for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. It was very nice to be with, um, spend some time with you today.